it's great. It was really great, great to be here. Great to hear uh, people who've been sort of some heroes in my faith. Um, Landon Saunders told a story years and years and years ago. I'm sure he doesn't remember it, um, but it has been one of the stories around which I've based my ministry. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, he said years ago, imagine that you were curled up on the floor and you had done the worst thing you could imagine. You're in the fetal position, your eyes are closed, and you slowly open your eyes and there's somebody leaning over you. When you open your eyes, who do you want to see there? And then seek to become that person. That somebody would want to see leaning over them if they'd just done the worst thing they could imagine. And that's the, who I decided I wanted to be for my 18 to 22 year olds that I spend my life with. If that happens and they open their eyes, if they see me leaning over them, they won't say, oh no, look who's here. Anyway, it's not a bad way to try to spend your life. Uh, I spent part of my early life trying to peddle my religion from door to door. Uh, we called it door knocking. It was a kinder and gentler time when you could knock on somebody's door and they probably wouldn't shoot you. And I've had some absolutely great experiences knocking on doors and then I've had some other experiences. And that largely depended upon who my partner was. And I had gone on a campaign at a place far away in a state that's just barely in the United States, a thoroughly unchurched place, and I was just a kid. I may have been a Harding student. I haven't quite got the chronology of it straight. But I was assigned a partner, an older sister, who as approached to door knocking, let's just say, was rather aggressive. And we would knock on a door, and she would always lead with the same line. Do you realize if you died today, you'd probably go to hell? <laughs> Which led the people on the other side of those doors to invite us to go first. Uh, uh, um. And I remember thinking even then, okay, is this the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I've come to share? Um, Okay, so I want I to do 10 minutes, maybe less, of utterly grim, and then cast a vision for the Church of God's Dreams from Luke Acts. First, the grim part. Uh, the cause for which Christ died, by most visible evidence, is doing terrible in North America. There's some promising news other places in the world. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this, you know, around the year 1900, probably 7% of the continent of Africa would have claimed to be Christian. That number is somewhere around 45% today. Christianity has never grown more quickly any place in the world than it has in Africa in the last century. The center of Christianity is now Africa, not America. African missionaries are leaving their home countries to go to African countries. There are a few African missionaries here in North America trying to evangelize this benighted place. Uh, what's going on in Asia in some ways is more amazing. In the year 1900, it would have been estimated that one half of 1% of the people in China would have claimed to be Christian. That's one half of 1%, not 50%. A hundred years later, that number is now, by the most conservative estimates, said to be somewhere around 7%. And I know 7% doesn't seem like a really high number to you, but we're talking about China here. Can you do the math on that? Let me help you. That is 7% of infinity. <laughs> <laughs> then in 
there are almost certainly more Chinese Christians in the world than there are American Christians. And they've got a plan. Um, I have been told by someone who frequents uh, China that there are 100,000 Chinese missionaries ready to go around the world when the borders open. And they've got this interesting theology. They think the gospel needs to go back where it came from, so they're going to head towards Jerusalem, right across Muslim countries. This is one of my favorite things. God is going to evangelize Muslims with Chinese. Did you have that on your strategic plan? <laughs> it's really exciting. But let me talk about where I live for a minute. Um, for years, uh, it was estimated that approximately 40% of the population of the United States would be in church someplace on a typical Sunday morning. Uh, we now know that number is not true today and probably never was. Uh, that number appears to have been the result of what some sociologists call the halo effect. Halo effect's really interesting. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an election coming up. And um, if after election you ask people if they voted, the number of people who report voting will be much higher than the percentage of people who actually voted. Everybody with me? It's called the halo effect. Or where I'm from in Arkansas, here we are in Arkansas, we call it lying. <laughs> okay. People lie about voting. Guess what else they lie about? Going to church. And if you do a different kind of counting, where you're not just asking, but you're counting, uh, you get a more accurate number. And that number is approximately 11.5%. Uh, it's down from 20% a few years ago. 11.5% actually is a little low. It's 13 14%. It'll be 115 by 2050. Uh, now, church going is not everything. There's a lot of really bad people who don't go to church, and there's some lovers of God who do, but it is something we can measure. Uh, and the young people here are going to raise their children in a world where nine out of ten people are not church goers. In other words, those of you who decide to spend your life in the U.S. are going to spend your life in one of the biggest missionaries in the world. If you want to go to a dark, benighted place that needs Christianity, let me suggest a place to you. The U.S. That would be one of those places. And what's interesting about this is this has happened at a time when Christian education has never been stronger, when we've never had greater resources or abilities, and in the midst of all that training, the cause for which Christ died is collapsing around us. And I say that and say, okay, I'll, I hope you will take what Landon said last hour seriously. We need some people to trot down some paths that are not well worn. And people like me are going to be surprisingly unhelpful because I'm part of that generation who's been part of watching it sort of just kind of collapse around us. So we're counting on you to be entrepreneurial, to be daring, to be risk-taking to think about how the good news finds footing in the world in which we find ourselves. Um, I, I spent uh, more of my life thinking about how to do spiritual formation with Christians than I have how to do uh, evangelism. And that too is fairly confusing, by the way, because what we used to do is have people read the Bible. Do you know the statistics show that men do not read a single book all the way through after they graduate from college the rest of their lives? Not one. Uh, by the way, I have overwhelming evidence they don't read one all the way through while they're in college, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's a different issue. 
And they go, okay, people are going to read, read their way into spiritual formation. It doesn't look like it. You got to think about different ways, different approaches. The world, she's changed. So, I just want to give you a couple of principles from Luke Acts. The Church of God's dreams. And then call you to kind of dream and, and live into it. Okay, uh, by now we know that Luke and Acts go together, right? And that to read one without the other is a... Well, you go to hell for it. Okay, so, okay, so we've got that out of the way. Okay, so I want you to think 1415. 1415. Luke 14, Acts 15. Luke 14, Acts 15. They go together. 1415. If you want to see what Luke Acts is about, 1415 is about what Luke Acts is about. In Luke chapter 14, uh, Jesus tells this story of a banquet where the invited guests have the audacity not to want to come. And so he sends his servants out to go and find anybody who wants to come and to bring them into the banquet. Uh, this is the story that just precedes Luke 15 where you have the prodigal son story. And one of the best ways to read the book of Luke is with the question, who gets invited to the party? Because the constant conflict in Luke is that certain religious leaders want to keep restricting the guest list, and Jesus keeps wanting to invite everybody. It's the fundamental conflict in Luke X. Who gets invited to the party? And so we come to this prodigal son story, uh, which is aimed at these people who are complaining about the fact that Jesus is filling the place up with sinners. And that story is so familiar. When I read it, I want to read myself into the prodigal son, but I'm not the prodigal son. I didn't have a prodigal son experience. It's not because I didn't want to. It's just that my parents were very strict. I wasn't allowed to sin. I'm the older brother. I'm the one who grew up in church and in fact have been slaving all these years to make sure it is a proper place to be. And then this punk comes home. I'm supposed to make a place for him? As if Jesus says, okay, you're a little slow, but yes. I want to throw a party, and I want everybody to come. Now, why wouldn't people in a hurting, broken world, why wouldn't they want to hear that? There must be something wrong about the way I'm telling that story. Um, have you noticed that, that you know, we, we, we tend to tell stories around ourselves, um, one of uh, one of my one of my good friends is uh, a, a pretty much an, an unchurched person, although he's always been drawn uh, to Jesus, and so it's kind of been my great honor every now and again to kind of walk alongside him in that. And I'm always trying to teach him just a little Bible and sneak it in if you're in help. And so we're we're out one. Christmas holiday, and we come to a nativity scene, and I tell him to look at it, he looks at it, and um, I said, what's wrong with that? He looks at it, he says, I don't know. I said, look at it, what's wrong with that? He looks at it, looks at it, and finally says, what are you getting at? And I said, there are shepherds and wise men there. The shepherds and the wise men were never there at the same time. By the time the wise men got there, they'd already moved into a house. They'd already moved into the suburbs by the time the wise men got there. They were never there at the same time. And he looks at it again, and he looks at me and says, shut up. <laughs> I said, what? He says, I like them there. Okay. 
Uh, you want me to tell you the Christmas story? Not for me, but for a hurting world. This teenage girl who's engaged shows up pregnant. And her husband knows he didn't do it. Now, I grant you ancient people weren't scientific, but they knew where babies came from. And so he's going to put her away because she's immoral. But because he's a good man, he's going to do it quietly. And God sends angels to Joseph and says, you're going to do no such thing because what is conceived of her is of God. And by the way, if that is going to be your story, you had better have an angel deliver it. <laughs> that one's going to be a little hard to believe. And not everybody got that story. And Joseph did. But I promise you, the people around Jesus' family could count. He probably had stuff said behind his back that I can't say in this polite audience. God, who could have him born anywhere, has him born in a barn. And surrounding his birth is the slaughter of all these innocents. You want to know the Christmas story? It's this. God decides to appear in the world in the midst of scandal and poverty and violence. So why don't people whose context is that recognize Jesus as their guy? Because I don't know how to tell the story. I haven't been paying attention the way Landon calls me to pay attention. To not just listen to the Bible, but to listen to it in the context of the world in which we find ourselves. So here's Jesus, as I want everybody to come to the party. Now, this is really hard, because you put a bunch of people who aren't like each other in the same party, and you're running risks. And in Acts 15, the boringest chapter in the book of Acts is by far the most critical. Because an issue has come up. And the issue is this, what do Gentiles have to do to be Christians? And there is a certain group within the Christian faith who has made the decision that Gentiles can certainly become Christians, but in order to do so, they first must become good Jews. Have to accept circumcision. And uh, this is a serious point. The apostles get together to debate this. And by the way, there's no question that Gentiles can become Christians. That got solved back in Acts 10. It got solved with the Samaritans in Acts 8. All these people can become Christians. The question is, what is going to be the basis of their entrance into the kingdom? Um, and in that debate, what the apostles decide is this. There is one and only one principle for entrance into the kingdom and it's faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And everybody is invited to the party. And then they do the weirdest thing. They send a letter and says, okay, we're sorry these people have troubled you with this, but, but don't, don't worry about it. And oh, by the way, there are certain things we don't want you to eat. They just declared that there's no principle for entrance into the kingdom of God except faith in Jesus, and then they turned around and put food regulations on them. It's strange. But the issue, the issue there is table fellowship. Because unless those new Gentile Christians are willing to give away some of their freedom, they will not be able to sit at the same table with their Jewish brothers and sisters. And sitting together at a table is the sign of fellowship and acceptance. What is at stake in Acts 15 is this. 
where there'll be where, where whether there will be one church or whether there will be two. And Paul um, lives and dies with this basic truth. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is not powerful enough to break down the dividing walls between people, the gospel is not true. It's not true because that's what he claims it does. There is in Christ neither. Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, they are all one in Christ Jesus. And if that's not true, the gospel's not true. So one of the fundamental testimonies to the truth of the gospel is a church that looks like that. Where everyone is invited to the party. And that is by my way of thinking, in a word, why the church is doing so badly in North America. At the end of the day, the Christians who got there first didn't really want the other people to be there. And they got the message. Um, Okay, I'm probably trying too hard, but I'm talking to young people. I'm always talking to young people. You're the best chance we've ever had. You are better at crossing lines. You are better at embracing the other. You are, are uh, more naturally loving towards people that are different than you are. You have got the ability to take the gospel in places where I couldn't dream of getting it. And I believe in you. Um, I believe you can do that. I'm sorry to say, people of my age aren't going to be more help. I wish we were. I'd like to tell you, we'll pay for it. I'd like to tell you, we'll try to create the context and the culture where it can happen, but a lot of the hard work is going to have to be done by you. Because you can do it. And the face of the church, which is changing so rapidly around the world, must change in North America, too. It's, it's got to look more like we, we look like. Um, um, a Methodist scholar who's great with a line, Leonard Sweet, says, the church loves blue hair. Unless it's on a 16-year-old. <laughs> who looks like he's just crawled out of a tackle box. Um, yeah. I get it. In one of my previous lives, um, I used to go around churches doing uh, weekend worship seminars. <laughs> this was when we were having what we called the worship wars. And you know, basically people complained about what kind of songs we were going to sing. And so I would go in on a weekend to fix this. And um, I, I quit doing that because almost every place I went, uh, things got worse. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is the only thing that is holding most churches together is lack of communication. Um, <laughs> and if you clear that up, you have really got some issues. <laughs> so when I got there, they thought they didn't like each other. And by the time I left, they were quite sure. Uh, <laughs> And I, I always did this thing at the end on Sunday morning. I would get in cahoots with the song leader, and I would say, okay, I want you to lead me three songs, uh, and I want you to lead them all with equal conviction. I want you to lead me a classic hymn. 
I want you to lead me a, um, for those of your Church of Christ background, a Stamps Baxter song. If you don't have a Church of Christ background, it's kind of country swing. Um, and I want you to sing, uh, lead a praise anthem. I call them 7 Eleven songs. You sing seven words 11 times. Um, <laughs> so I would, uh, I would have him lead, and right there in church, after he'd done that, I'd say, okay, now we're going to vote on which of those songs you like the best. And right there in church, we would vote, and it would come out about one-third, one-third, and one-third. The classic hymn was always a little less than one-third because there are very few of us who have really good taste in church music. But anyway, <laughs> I said, okay, well, now, first of all, you know what it's like to be the song leader in this church. Two-thirds of the people always wish you were singing something other than what you're singing. <laughs> but there's something else going on, too. Uh, the question is, do you care more about the people who had their hands up when you didn't than you do about your taste in church music? Because that's about what it amounts to. And that's a spiritual issue. That's an Acts 15 issue where there, where, where the, will there be one church or will there be two or three or four? And if I had it all to do over again, which I have no interest in doing, I'd say one more thing. I hope next time I'm here, we're not talking about classic Stamps Baxter praise anthems. I hope we're talking about rap and rock and post-rock. Because I hope you have filled this place up with people who are going to bring their music and their lives in for redemption by the kingdom of God. Now, those will be conversations worth having. One more time from Leonard Sweet. The future of the church depends on whether we will be willing to put the living water in vessels we wouldn't be caught dead drinking out of. Because the question is not whether I like the vessel. The question is, will it contain the living water? Here's the church of God's dream. It shows it to us in Luke by the big party. It shows it to us in Acts with a fundamental decision that we are going to, to give ourselves for this one cause and try to make sure that everybody can come to the party. Um, I don't know if you're encouraged or discouraged by the state of the church in the North America, but that's not really the point. The best we can do is be faithful today to this grand cause and then see what God does with it. Um, he's proven to be amazingly resourceful. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.